Hello and welcome. I'm a historian, as you've just heard, uh, amongst other things of the future, which seems slightly paradoxical, considering we usually think history is the past. But in fact, of course, human beings have always had an image of where they're going, often an ideal, as well as an image of where they came from, sometimes an ideal and sometimes not. That ideal often serves, particularly when it becomes future-oriented, as a kind of map, a guidebook, a sense of destination, a way which gives us, in particular, a peculiar advantage over our everyday lives, the bubbles we live in, the four-year economic cycles, the five-year political cycles, whatever they are. Utopia gives us the possibility of examining the distant future. And we do so via a kind of map, taking us from the present towards a destination, which we hope will be very considerably better than the place we're at at the moment. The problem at the outset, of course, is no one draws this map in quite the same way. We all have our own peculiar ideas, but yet utopia is also an intensely social concept. That's one of the main themes I want to try to clarify this morning. Uh, I will give you some sense of how I drew my own map and then what I think the relevance of the uh, many years I spent studying the subject is for thinking about our future in the 21st century. So a little bit of background. Uh, I was born in Paris, in France. Uh, I was an only child. My parents divorced when I was quite young, and my mother took me and sent me away to boarding school. She had no other way of working and uh, taking care of me at the same time. I hated the experience, I have to say. I was bullied. I had a foreign accent. We know what little children can be like. Uh, with foreigners and outsiders, and I became rather lonely, uh, perhaps estranged from my environment. I built up a certain kind of resentment, I think. Uh, perhaps it made me a bit of a rebel, no bad thing either. Uh, but uh, there was a uh, real difficulty with making friends in that kind of milieu. So to compound this, my mother remarried, but uh, into a family which involved a great deal of movement. So over 10 years, I lived in about eight different places, many different countries as well. This was highly advantageous insofar as it allowed me to see something of the world, but again, it reinforced uh, my lack of the ability to make connections with people. Uh, so the first episode in my uh, road to utopia occurs at about the age of 10 and I think serves as a kind of compensation for this process as it uh, was developing. I invented my own country. I drew it out on a large piece of paper with uh, colored pencils. It had it looked something like Austria, actually. It had high mountains and sparkling blue lakes, and there was a capital city, and I designed the stamps and the coins because I collected these things as a child. Uh, the country was called Gregoria. <laughs> and the currency was the Gregorian, and it was ruled over by, you guessed it, Good King Gregory. <laughs> so, a childish fantasy of power, perhaps. It's definitely a utopia, isn't it? An ideal society, but an ideal society in which the will of one person, uh, my evident uh, uh, inability to come to uh, grips with my own personal situation, the will of one person is imposed upon an entire society. So, this, I think, planted the seeds in my mind for thinking about ideal societies. So if we fast forward now a little bit, I had the great good fortune in the summer of 1967 uh, to be living south of San Francisco. This is the so-called summer of love, of course. The uh, first explosive moment where the countercultural revolt against middle-class mores against styles of dress, styles of uh, eating against the war in Vietnam, which was going on then. A whole host of factors came together to create a new social movement uh, 
hostile to basically the whole way in which uh, not only North American but large parts of European society had developed since the Second World War. Uh, I thought this was a splendid idea. I thought that the ideals of the counterculture, uh, the sense of fraternity, the sense of uh, love, the antagonism to war, were splendid. And to an impressive degree, I think I still really, even in uh, a much more advanced age, stand by many of those ideals today. Uh, there was a strong sense of bonding, we should recall, about the counterculture, so it gave me a sense of community, uh, a sense of friendship. We differentiated ourselves by the music that we listened to, by the clothes that we wore, by the language we used. It was us versus them, but for the first time, really, for me, I was part of an us, and that was uh, deeply... Uh, emotional uh, period in my life. So at the end of this long cycle, which involved, of course, two often quite contradictory trends. On the other hand, uh, on the one hand, a political trend, uh, the student revolts in Paris and Berlin and so on. Uh, on the other hand, a deeply introspective, almost spiritual trend. I was more influenced initially by the latter than the former, but I think we were all aware as the 60s ended, that these two aspects of the counterculture were in a very uneasy relationship with one another. So at the end of this period, I even ended up going to India in search of enlightenment. Uh, I found it, but not quite where you'd think it was. I found it in the encyclopedia under E when I got home. Because I began to study again, and I realized that a lot of what I'd been thinking in the last few years was, well, idealistic, yes, in the good sense, but also perhaps overly fanciful in a lot of ways. So I started to study the Scottish and the British Enlightenment when I went back to university. Uh, and I began to get a sense that there was a historical narrative that I needed to understand. So now for about a five-year period, uh, internal struggle took place in my mind. Uh, on the one hand, I had mm, reached a kind of spiritual destination from 67 onwards, which uh, epitom was epitomized to me in Buddhism, uh, an atheistic religion, of course, uh, but a life-denying religion at the same time. Um, Buddhism can bring, I meditated, of course, a great deal of internal peace and harmony, a strong sense of the value of uh, the individual, but uh, at the end of the day, it's a life-denying philosophy. The aim is to get off the wheel of karma, to end suffering. Running parallel with this was an increasing politicization as I began to appreciate the other trends of 67, 68. So I began to read Marx, the other socialist uh, writers, and for about five years, these two strands, the one life-denying, the other markedly life-affirming, uh, moved parallel but in contradiction and tension in my mind. So I was there with uh, the Buddha uh, saying, Om Mani Padme Hum, uh, looking for my own internal cohesion and uh, peace. And on the other hand, another voice in the other ear was saying, but comrade, what about the class struggle? So this tension had to be resolved. I took uh, much longer than I should have. My supervisor uh, gave me enough rope to hang myself. I spent three years on my master's dissertation, 300 pages, trying to reconcile Marxism and Buddhism. Well, don't allow MA students to try to solve the essential questions of the meaning of life. It is not a good idea. Um, but I worked it out of my system, in a way. At the end of this period, then, I began my PhD, and I began to work on early socialism. Socialism in Britain, in particular, in the period before Marx, between about 1800 and about 1850 or so. Robert Owen and his followers, if the, ring, uh, if the name rings any bell uh, to any of you. So I was very lucky. I found a lot of material. I was extremely enthusiastic about this uh, subject. And I began to realize that going beyond Marx, certainly, the socialist cause in general was about brotherhood. It was about 
a sense of community. It was about the close bonds between human beings and intensifying and building upon those bonds wherever possible. In the midst of a society, of course, which constantly pits people against each other as competitors and encourages each to think that they should uh, race ahead and elbow aside all of those who are in uh, the way of the pursuit of their goals in life. Uh, and it came uh, to be fairly clear to me that this idea of sociability was something that I had been interested in for a very long time without it being entirely clear what I was precisely pursuing. So by the middle of the 1980s, I was beginning to move from uh, the study of socialism as such towards the larger, broader subject of utopianism. 1984, with a lot of other scholars in the field, of course, we had to reconsider George Orwell's contribution, the most famous of the dystopian texts. And that also set me thinking, of course, about the negative sides. Uh, now, I've never come to the view that utopia leads you inevitably to dystopia, or I wouldn't be standing on this stage today. But it's quite clear that some forms of the pursuit of an extreme and perfectionist kind of utopia can do so. So in the course of the 1980s, I was um, moving, uh, and in particular after 1989 to 91. I mean, if this I became a historian of socialism, and then socialism collapsed at the end of this decade. The timing didn't seem uh, very fortunate from my point of view, but it, it was a good opportunity to move into the literature. So I went back to Thomas More. This is one of the most famous images of the island of Utopia. And I began for uh, about 15 years or so to delve into the literary traditions before more, back to Plato, back to Sparta under Lycurgus, the, one of the most important models for the utopian tradition, and to try to investigate what the entire spectrum of utopian possibility looked like. It was already clear to me that uh, it had been clear really from the outset when I began studying Marx. Uh, if you take the 1844 manuscripts of Marx, this is a humanist critique of Stalinism as much as it is capitalism. And what Marxism, Leninism, Stalinism, and so on had degenerated into, I was very aware was not utopia at all. It was no kind of ideal. It was a kind of caricature, a false enforced sociability of uh, party consciousness and so on, but not the kind of ideal that most of us, certainly coming out of the experience of the 1960s, would want to affiliate ourselves with. So as I moved in this period now, I was beginning to move also again in parallel into an interest in dystopian writing, about which I thought much less had been written, uh, as well as the literary utopia. So I published a number of volumes of these. This was the days before the internet, where we still read books in the library. Uh, and uh, I thought it was very important to get these texts out there in order for people to read them. A lot of the material was relatively obscure, but it turned out that the spectrum of utopian possibility from people living in caves on their own, the Robinson Crusoe kind of motif, uh, right through voluntary or intentional communities of hundreds, sometimes thousands, or in aggregate tens and even hundreds of thousands of people, uh, these kinds of movements demonstrated that people could move away from the mainstream uh, increasingly individualist ideas and embrace a stronger form of community. Problem was always that we didn't, in making these moves, want to sacrifice the individualism which had appeared for the last 500 years or so, had been one of the great evolutionary movements uh, in world culture. So by the beginning of this century, then, I began a lengthy study of dystopia, mostly for the reason, in the first instance, that this hadn't been done before and it needed to be done methodically and over a long period of time, but also because the temper of the times was changing fairly dramatically. I remembered Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, the first book to warn about the impact of pesticides upon uh, agriculture. I remembered Chernobyl. I wasn't living very far from here, in fact, uh, at that time. Uh, the consciousness that came out of 68 was, in part, 
a green consciousness. And this was always a kind of side interest of mine. And the utopian tradition, it seemed to me, offered a number of very strong messages for those who were starting to think environmentally and ecologically. Utopian communities, one thinks here, uh, for example, of that portrayed in William Morris's famous News from Nowhere of 1890, one of the best known British 19th century texts. Utopian texts were often aware of the relationship between human beings and nature. Morris, in particular, spells out very clearly the need to get rid of the pollution of the waters and so on, to allow the salmon to swim in the Thames in London, which is unthinkable in that period. So this ran as a minor theme. The turn of the 21st century, of course, began to be the period when the warning lights were beginning to flash. The world's population was getting, as it seems now, overly large. The destructive impact through our patterns of consumption on the environment was becoming increasingly rapid, and a discourse, of course, emerged of climate change and of global warming. I don't like this language today. I prefer to call the scenario before us catastrophic environmental destruction. And the reason for this, of course, is that those of you, as many of you no doubt have, who followed the narratives of th this form in the last five, six years, but even intensely in the last six months, know that the scenarios which originated with Kyoto through the Paris Agreement of first 2 degrees Celsius maximum cap on global warming, then 1.5 degrees, uh, now seemed overwhelmingly over-optimistic. In the last year, it's become increasingly clear that this is potentially the last century of humanity. Temperatures will rise. They are rising now. Uh, CO2 emissions are continuing to rise. There's a lot of hot air from politicians, but there hasn't been any action. Which brings me to my second slide. This is, of course, great Greta, Greta Thunberg, one of the most impressive of all of the actors on the world stage at the moment, the environmental activist who has uh, almost single-handedly orchestrated a worldwide movement of resistance using civil disobedience to make aware to the general public the degree of severity of the threat of environmental destruction. The moment has come when we have to be extraordinarily alarmed. This is not a time for hope, but yet, and Thunberg herself has said, she doesn't want hope. She wants people to be frightened, and I think she's absolutely right about this. This gives us, I think, the opportunity to witness the fact that we can make a difference ourselves. We can only do so, however, by acting extremely quickly, and that's the message which I think we can uh, be left with today. Thank you very much.